Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Taking Jeff Goldblum to Life Aquatic. Willem Dafoe to Aquaman. Nicole Kidman to Dead Call. Sam Neill hunting for Red October. James Earl Jones to the Swashbuckler. Finally, Robert Shaw. Jaws. Just when you thought it was safe to say that you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Tom, Josh, Dan, dive into six buildings, anchored by six different actors, swimming us all the way to the summer blockbuster that birthed summer blockbusters. Jaws. Six films, six actors, six weeks. Three guys, one podcast, the fire pivot. It's going to be a Jaws dropping summer trip. My father was a lighthouse keeper. My mother was a queen. But life has a way of bringing people together. They made me what I am. Permission to come aboard. Your half-brother, King Orm, is about to declare war upon the surface world. The only way to stop this war is for you to take your rightful place as king. Trust me, I am no king. My brother has come from the surface to challenge me for the throne. I'm no leader. I came because I have no choice. I came to save my home and the people that I love. I think you're unworthy to leave because you're of two different worlds. That is exactly why you are worthy. A war is coming to the surface. And I'm bringing the wrath of the seven seas with me. We're here. What are you doing? Wait, wait, wait. You should have a parachute. Redheads, you gotta love them. Come guys. to the beach. Guys, 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 guys. What do Adam Sandler and Jason Momoa have in common? Josh, I don't like where this is going. Me either. They both play water guys. Uh, <laughs> get it? God. No. Oh, God. no, 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 get it. Adam Sandler played the water boy, and now Jason Momoa played Aquaman, and Aqua means water, and he plays you know, water man. So, you know, it's. Dan, it's a... Dan, we get it. Please, please don't explain the joke. But, but it was a good joke. Dude, that was the Pacific Rim of jokes. <laughs> Get it? Oh. Just, no, just, you thought it was the, Oh, come. That movie was terrible. You all know it. We've been talking about it for years. That movie Tom. was lousy. You're the Tom. only ones. Tom, you don't need to explain it again why you hate that movie. Just stop. Yeah, everyone loved that movie but you. You're like a Last Jedi fanboy. Oh, oh, oh too far, dude. Too yeah, far. Man. Yeah, that was just too easy. Yeah, just awful words use. God. I know, right? Is this... Wait, what? Word use? Yeah, he used the possessive your instead of you are. It's just, come on. Wait, did you catch that? Oh, That's... God. He's going meta now. Dan, would you please do the intro now? Uh, I assigned that to Tom this week. Uh... Uh... Wait, why am I growing? It's my time to shine! <laughs> <laughs> Hello, bots and listeners. Welcome back to the fire pit. And welcome to the big one four. That's right. 14 episodes in. And we're just now hitting our stride. Getting sauced. While we swim towards Jaws. Second week into Sink or Swim Summer Tour. S-O-S-S-T, sauced. For those... We get it, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Tom, if you didn't guess, catch that. British name Thompson. And last week we took a look at The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou, a movie that neither Josh nor Dan had ever seen. And the consensus was they liked it. Hey, Mikey. <laughs> and now it's my turn to see a movie they've seen that I haven't. 
And as per the rules uh, here at the fire pit, uh, we've taken an actor or actress from the last film to lead us to this one. And to tell us that connection, I now turn it over to Josh. Thank you, thank you, Thompson. I, uh, as said, I am Josh, British name Reginald. And as mentioned last week, we followed Jeff Goldblum from uh, Independence Day to The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou, a surprisingly fantastic film also starring the legendary William Defoe. Willem Defoe. Yeah, not William. So, Willem. Not William, it's Willem. Uh, who, uh, he's going to, from, uh, Who's going to go from making Bill Murray not sink his boat to uh, helping Jason Momo regain his kingdom of Atlantis in Fast and the Furious High Tide. Nigel will explain that in a moment, if you don't get the joke. This is our first superhero movie in the podcast. Although it's not our first movie based on a comic book, that honor falls to our first, air quotes, recorded podcast in this unending train, which was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Um, To give us a rundown on... uh, what well, we can look forward to this week. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dan. Thank you, Josh. As always, I am Dan, British name Nigel. And uh, as mentioned, we are going to watch Aquaman tonight. And here's a few facts and tidbits about the film we're going to be watching. It was released on December 21st, 2018. So it's technically a Christmas film, even though it doesn't mention Christmas at all. But it was a holiday release. So it had a budget of 160 to 200 million dollars that's the estimate um somewhere between that number and it had a box office of 1.148 billion so Jesus it, god yeah it uh made a ton of money warner brothers was quite pleased with its uh box office returns yeah what the crap yeah i had no i i knew it was a box office success when i was looking up the facts of this film i had no idea it was this much of a success even if it was at the top end of the 200 million dollar budget it still returned 1.148 billion dollars yeah so, that was its international budget i mean domestically i think it's uh shit i don't even know what it made domestically but i know domestically it's one of the top five grossing uh dc movies yeah it made a ton of money um, it has a uh, 75 or 65%, I'm sorry, 65% on Rotten Tomatoes as of this airing. And so it's it's a fresh movie, I guess. Um, and it has an IMDb of 7 out of 10, which is surprisingly the same rating uh, Life Aquatic had, a 7 out of 10 on IMDb. It's a, I guess, critically, six, moderately critically successful DC film. I don't want to say overwhelmingly critically successful but it's definitely better than like uh, Batman's V Superman's 28% on Rotten Tomatoes and Man of Steel's, I think it was at uh, 55? 55% on Man of Steel. So 56. So 56% Man of Steel, 55% uh, Batman V Superman. That's much, much better than the other two films. And I think Suicide Squad, somewhere in the teens. I'm not even going to bother looking that up. That movie's terrible. To explain Josh's joke... James Wan Wan directed one Fast and the Furious film, Furious 7. So that's why he called this uh, Fast and the Furious High Tide. Oh! Come on. Wouldn't it make an awesome name for a Fast and the Furious movie? They'll they'll like drive on the water or something? I mean, it can't get any more ridiculous than it already is. Well, I'm almost positive Furious 9, 10, or 11 will probably fall into that category. Because they are running out of car things to do. Um, either that or I'm looking forward to the eventual merger with the Transformers franchise. But speaking of the Rotten Tomatoes scores, uh, this movie we're watching tonight, Aquaman, is part of the DCEU, Warner Brothers' answer to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Both movie franchises or movie uh, platforms have um, brought these superhero movies into the mainstream. And it's an answer to the Marvel Cinematic Universe's question. And it's an answer that Warner Brothers often gets wrong. Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Suicide Squad were the first three movies in this universe, and they were just blasted by critics. And most of the audience scores for these movies are pretty polarizing. You either love it or you hate it. There's very little in between. So audiences are very torn on these films. However, with Justice League, prefaced by saying Justice League was still blasted by critics, um, the studio started to meddle a little bit less and try to make the movies a little more fun and started to let the directors be a little more loose with it. Although, in fairness, Batman v Superman and Man of Steel were both directed by Zack Snyder. So Wonder Woman was a big success, both critically and financially. 
in Aquaman and Shazam were also much, much better received. That's not to say Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and even Suicide Squad were not financially successful, but they were blasted by critics, just destroyed. So Rightfully so, too. I, just, oof. And what is it? Isn't Wonder Woman the highest grossing DC movie? Or no? I don't know if it's the highest grossing one. It's. I, I, I think, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, I want to say that when Joker came out last year, Wonder Woman got knocked from the top five. I'm looking at Wonder Woman in box office mode, Joe. I'm just going to say right now, she did good, but she did not do Aquaman good. Uh, yeah. Worldwide, it, she did about 100 and, or excuse me, 822 million. So just a little bit shy of a billion. And also Wonder Woman was a summer release too. It was a June movie, whereas Aquaman was a December movie. And in all fairness, uh, I mean, I know it's December 21st and it's a holiday film, but this um, it's not explicitly a Christmas. It's not a Christmas movie at all. The movie doesn't take place during Christmas, has nothing to do with Christmas, but it was released in the holiday season. And normally this is the time that you, you might release the movie and hope that it makes a little bit of money in the two weeks the kids got off of school. But uh, a 1.148 billion is a lot more money than just the two-week Christmas break most kids get. So yeah. um, this, this had some legs. This definitely had some legs and made some money. Well, well, here's also... the breakdown of domestically. The top five, uh, mm -hmm. starting with number five, domestic box office poll. Number five was Man of Steel with 291 million. Number four was Suicide Squad with 325 million. So yeah, definitely made more than a Superman solo movie. I mean, come on. And then number three was Batman v Superman with 330. It made five million more than Suicide Squad. And then at number two was Aquaman with 335 million. And number one was Wonder Woman with 412 million. So yeah. American it, stateside Wonder Woman did better, but overseas is where Aquaman found his swimming legs. It's possible. I don't maybe I don't know if the perception of Aquaman is different overseas than he is here in America. It seems like no matter how badass they try to make Aquaman in the comics or even in this movie where he's pretty badass and played by Jason Momoa, who's known for playing pretty badass characters, no matter what the American perception of Aquaman has always been still that super friends kind of interpretation of to me, my fishes, <laughs> my fish powers are of no use in the desert. Wonder woman. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah. Or, or it also could be the fact that this is one of the first superhero movies led by a not white, but not black, a brown protagonist. He's, a, he's Samoan. Yeah. I mean, he's Samoan, but he's brown. And like most of the world is, you know, brown. So well, he probably people can identify more with him. Like I know I would. I I, I identify more with him being a brown guy myself mm -hmm. than uh, I would with you know Superman. Even though Superman's arguably my favorite superhero. I did find that when they casted him in the role as Aquaman, less you know less of the uh, the 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 fanboys quote unquote were upset about Jason Momoa being cast as because Aquaman's traditionally drawn as uh, blonde haired. Oh, I thought um, it was a fantastic choice. Polynesian uh, guys, a uh, Aquaman. Yeah. That just makes sense. That's yeah. like because wasn't like Blade originally a uh, white character? Like no, I know he was black. white. In the, no, uh, Blade was always black, but he wasn't always. I know he, he was like my introduction to Blade was uh, in the Spider-Man animated TV show in the '90s. You know, with mm -hmm. uh, redhead Peter Parker, but uh, right. He was white in that one. That was my introduction to Blade. So when Blade the movie came out, I was like, oh, they made him black. That's cool. He makes sense to be black. Was he white in the cartoon? Really? He was He was white he was, in the cartoons. He was... And he had a lightsaber, if I remember correctly. I do remember that. And he had like, no, that was Morbius that had the uh, sucker hands to draw blood because right. Saturday morning cartoons in the 90s were weird like that. No, he didn't no. draw blood. He drew plasma. Yeah, because they couldn't say blood on TV either. So... <laughs> I mean, how did he extract the plasma from the blood? I don't. Saturday morning cartoons. From what I'm Saturday used. morning cartoons. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Josh. From what I'm looking at with the drawing of Blade and the Spider-Man animated show, I think he was supposed to be black, but I don't think the animation looked consistent because his hairstyle and the way he looks. But yeah, anyways, you're probably right, Josh. And Jason Momoa Aquaman, while he's not blonde hair, blue eyed, white man Aquaman, he still looks a lot like how when they redid Aquaman in the 90s. With yeah. the long, long hair and the uh, shirt yeah, you know, that shirtless kind of look that he had with the 90s. And then he eventually got the hook hand thing. And Yeah, that was mm. with the uh, Justice League animated show, which is at that time, amazing. I think it's it's still amazing writing to this day. He's, well, oh, yes. I loved that Aquaman look because he's supposed to be the king of Atlantis, and that Aquaman looked very kingly with he the did. long flowing hair and the beard and just that 
ripped look that he had. Like, he looks like a king that I just wouldn't want to mess with. Yeah, he did, he belongs standing next to guys like Superman and Martian Manhunter and Batman and them. Yeah, what up? I'm king of the sea. What you guys bring into the table? Exactly. And so I, I, I enjoy seeing that version of Aquaman. And I'm kind of glad they went with that kind of look for this movie. He's not as clean cut looking. And I really like Jason Momoa in Justice League. He, he yeah. had his presence on the screen. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing him in this film. I, I credit a lot of the positive traits to Justice League to character flaws added in by Joss Whedon after the fact, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, apparently it was Joss Whedon's thing to give Flash, make him kind of scared to save people, and add that line where Batman's just like, just save one, and then see where you're at, type of thing. And yeah. then mm -hmm. to give, uh, like, the whole uh, sitting on the, the lasso, lasso of, truth. of truth. Thank you, <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> sitting on Wonder Woman's lasso of truth, uh, that was added in by uh, Joss Whedon, and I thought that was a very awesome character development scene for Aquaman. Even though yeah. it ultimately ended in a, a humorous punchline, but I thought that was good character development. But that's a Whedon trope too. Like a serious yeah, moment is kind enough. of there are no yeah. serious moments. Yeah, he's 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 been doing that since Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where they have like a really serious conversation about how they need to save the world and they, all their lives depend on it and this that, and the other. And then Xander makes a quip about his penis size or something like that. Like that's just Jaws Whedon. Uh, I thought the casting of Jason Momoa was perfect and fits along with the DCEU and. I'm kind of glad that they're only going to soft reboot the DCEU because I know that most of the movies have been rightly just dragged through the mud by critics, mm -hmm. but there are some good qualities to the movies. Most of these movies, when you watch them, you can see the good movie trying to get out. Yeah, it's like Batman v Superman is so obviously three movies packed into one. You could see Superman's sequel, you can see Batman's movie, and you can see the Batman and Superman movie. You could mm -hmm. see all three movies in there. The Superman movie would have been good by itself, but no, they had to pack everything in there. You can tell that that was a movie designed by committee. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they, they basically ripped that one page for page from Dark Knight Returns. Oh, God, now I can't remember the guy that played Lex Luthor, but he essentially played Joker in that film anyways. Might as well have just cast Joker in that film. Andy Samberg. Thank you. No, wait. <laughs> no. Damn it. No. It was film. Mark Zuckerberg. Wait. <laughs> Te no, Wait. Technically not wrong. <laughs> One of these days we will watch that film and I can give my entire, just, I have a closet full of just things that are wrong with the Batman v Superman film I that I do. want. I think when we get to that movie, we're going to have to do with our podcast that they should have done with that movie and make it a two-parter because we're yeah. going to have to watch the movie and then our final thoughts are going to be another two and a half hours. Yeah. yeah but Look let's, forward let's... to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm honestly curious about this film. I'm tepidly curious one i'm excited to see jason momoa in a big role because i remember nigel us watching him in stargate atlantis yes and yes. i thought dude this guy's awesome as as hell he's and he was in um i guess the remake of conan the barbarian that they tried to do on a budget of yeah, few it wasn't years a very back. good movie but uh, that no. was after like i remember they announced that movie after he was had already shown in uh call drogo in uh the first season of game of thrones which you know mm -hmm. we don't talk about that that series anymore but we will all admit that the first like five seasons were amazing oh uh, and he was badass oh, as call was, drogo I, I remember he had this dothraki like speech where he was just pumped and throwing his fists around and just it was mm -hmm. awesome and i'm like dude this guy is gonna nail it as freaking conan yeah the Barbarian, yes. not o'brien I play a, a Star Trek Online MMO, and I, when I created my Klingon character, I created a Klingon character to look like the original series Klingons without the ridges and slightly orange-looking skin and all that, or yellowish-orange skin, and I modeled him off of Jason Momoa, because I'm like, if I ever make a Star Trek show, I want him to be a Klingon. Unfortunately, we can't afford him now. Yeah, we can't afford him now. He's got DC money now. It's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. He was in a movie that made a billion dollars. <laughs> we absolutely cannot afford him yeah. anymore. He was a lead in a movie that made a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I am honestly uh, excited that Tom is finally sitting down to watch this movie. For our listener and uh, hi, Peggy, and uh, our several <laughs> bots, Tom historically is the member of the group that does not like movies like at all like he doesn't just he doesn't just not like movies he is literally prejudiced against them so uh don't don't argue with me here tom dan agrees we've already <laughs> discussed this <laughs> however we'll walk out of a movie theater and tom will say that he likes the movie and then like 
later that night, he'll start texting us and being like, oh, well, uh, it was crap. <laughs> but uh, to be fair. 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 We all walked out of Man of Steel absolutely loving that movie, and all of our opinions on that movie have changed since then. But Tom did walk out of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Nigel, out of Civil War saying that he did enjoy that movie. And he has since then changed his mind. Uh, it might have been Civil War. It might have been... I don't Man think I got to watch Steel. that one with you, but I heard about it after the fact. But like he did say that he liked um, The Force Awakens. But we all agreed that uh, Last Jedi sucked, so... I'm trying yeah, to you be hear him polite. groaning. You hear him groaning. You hear Because I'm... he knows it's true. He knows it's true. <laughs> But he's he's trying to go back on it. And I'm very happy that we're recording tonight's episode. <laughs> this way, if he likes the movie, it will be on tape. Mm, now, see, there there's a lot of misremembering history going on here. And I'm being a polite friend and letting them have their say. Um, if there was any quote-unquote changing of minds it was less changing and more noticing the flaws well before everyone else did i'm not gonna uh, lie i'm not gonna lie the text message that we did receive a few hours after watching the force awakens was ray is a total mary sue to which me and dan argued that point with him because we agreed that she wasn't however we have since changed our minds yeah and i do and in, in tom's defense I walked out of the Last Jedi, or not the Last Jedi. The uh, it was, was the last it, yeah, yeah. Last, I walked out of the Last Jedi saying I liked that movie. It was really good. And then when I went to take my daughter to it a couple of days later, I'm halfway through the movie going, "Oh my god, this is terrible." And that because... was one of the rare instances where me and Tom agreed on a movie and Dan didn't, because ninety percent of the time it's me and Dan agreeing and Tom not. I think yeah. I think sometimes in to Tom to defend Tom here a little bit. I think sometimes when we see a movie and everyone's guilty of this, you remember the last few moments of a movie of how the movie finished, and not how the movie started or how it ran. And it's almost like if uh, you're eating a meal and your steak was overcooked, but the cheesecake you had for dessert was amazing. You remember the amazing cheesecake and you're like, that was a really good dinner. You forget the fact that your steak was dry as a bone. Some movies are like that too, like Force Awakens and The Last Jedi and uh, even like Man of Steel and those movies, like they ended on big action scenes, awesome moments, cool one-liners, uh, hand-to-hand fights with the ba- with the big bad. And then you walk out of the movie theater going, ooh, that was an action-packed film. That was good. And then you, you start to think about it later on. You're like, man, that middle part was really boring. Yeah, that's why and- I always have my 24-hour review because it's like after I walk out of the movie, I'm like, that was a 10 out of 10. But then mm-hmm. after about a day, I'm all like, yeah, that was kind of a, you know, an eight out of 10. Yeah. But yeah. Now, you got, you I, got I am just, I'm just friendly down, ribbing yeah. you, Tom, you know, as I do. Yeah. yeah I, and, I know you love me, baby. I do. And uh, this is a movie for Tom that kind of like the Life Aquatic last week was for us. That you and I both admitted at the end of our final thoughts, Josh, that if we hadn't gone with Tom's list and seen that movie, we probably never would have seen a Life Aquatic. It's not one of the, it was a movie that where we, we would pass up time and time again. I, I made the joke that it's one of those movies where someone's like, oh, you got to watch it. You're like, I'll oh, put it on my list. And it never goes on your list. Like you're yeah, never going to watch it. And Aquaman's is, is like this for Tom. It's probably a movie, Tom, and you, you'd be free to admit this, that you would have just passed up and never watched and been happy never watching it, even though everyone else loves it. But now that we're watching it, you, I don't want to say forced, but we're quote unquote forced to watch the film for this it. list. For this list, I this he Josh makes a point. I I did pick this film, yes. so it's my. I'm walking into this one. That was actually going to be the original punchline of the the, the first uh, cold open that I told you guys I I was <laughs> working on. Yeah, I was, was going to be like you arguing against the, the movie, but like me and Tom were, or Dan were just going to keep repeating. You picked it, and then you're going to say something, and then me and Dan were going to be like, but you picked it. <laughs> I mean, depending on how this viewing goes, that that could still work, Josh. Yeah, we'll we'll know if uh, the opening line of Tom's final thoughts are, "Oh God, what have I done?" <laughs> so... <laughs> Which actually brings me to my question. Um, this is a flip from yeah last week where I'm going in blind and you two are going in knowing what you're getting into. How many times have you guys seen this film? I've only seen it all the way through in its entirety one time, and that was when it was in the theaters. Okay. Uh, right. For, for me, probably right. about three times. I watched it in theaters. I watched it when it came out on video, and I just recently rewatched it the other day. But then again, the last two times, 
I've got like my ADD kicks in and I can't really just straight up and watch a movie, like concentrate on it. So it's like, I'm always doing something, but sure. Um, I, I did watch it and you know, it's like, I got all the big scenes and I always watch them all, but you know, it's like on the boring scenes, I'll, I'll flip my phone on or whatnot. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. I put it on a couple months ago on my TV and uh, it ended up being background noise. I got hung up doing something on the computer and, and I don't, I think I looked up to watch the movie twice. So I didn't really watch it. But I've only actually seen it in its entirety one time, and that was when I saw it in theaters. I've I've seen bits and pieces of it since. Mm -hmm. So in this subsequent viewing, I told this will probably be your second ish time seeing yeah. it all the way through. I imagine it, depending on how well it goes or how well it doesn't go, will depend on how much we focus on it and how much we don't focus. But what are you hoping to get out of this film in this viewing? I'm hoping to maybe get some better perspective on the potential of mm. the DC of the DC EU, the DC cinematic universe, because this movie and wonder woman are, I enjoyed them both of them when I saw them in theaters and did not change my opinion on them in the coming weeks. I didn't say, you know what? On second thought, that movie kind of sucked. Like I did, like I did on, on Man of Steel. Like Man of Steel, I really enjoyed it when I let when I left the theater. Went to see it again, still enjoyed it. But a couple weeks later, I'm just kind of like, I think when it actually wasn't even a couple weeks later, it was a few months later when the movie came out on DVD and I was able to start watching it over and over and over again. I liked it less and less every time I saw it um, because I started to see the things that I didn't we like were, about the film. We were blinded. I mean, when that movie came out, me and Dan were texting each other to the like minute, three hours and thirty five minutes left to go. Yeah, we were that excited for that movie. But I am curious to see the turnaround of the DCEU. I think they really are trying. They well, they want to. You know, they want to compete with Marvel. They see the billions and billions of dollars. They see that those fan reactions. You know that Warner Brothers and DC wants to be a part of that because they've done. They did it first. Mm -hmm. Batman and Batman and Superman are two of the oldest superheroes in existence. But I am. I ho I'm hoping to watch this movie and just get a, a new perspective on what the change of the DCEU is. Although if the Harley Quinn movie is any indication, not all lessons have been learned. No, so, my wife, my wife watched that movie. She walked up to me and she's like, don't watch that movie. Oh shit. Oh, yeah. Carissa don't like it. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. It was, I haven't seen it yet either, but I've heard nothing good. I haven't even heard like any redeeming qualities about it. Like even people who hate Batman V Superman will say, well, Ben Affleck was good in the movie. Like the Batman scenes were really cool. He's or, quoting me right there. Even people who hate that movie have something positive to say about Batman v Superman. I have heard nothing positive about Birds of Prey or whatever they called it. Yeah, to piggyback off what you just said about like the whole DC wanting that, uh, what Marvel has. I, I'm sorry, you guys have to hear this again, but you know, all of our listener and uh, bots <laughs> have to hear this at least once from me. Just put it on repeat and you'll understand how many times that these guys have actually had to hear this me say this line. But I always like to think like 20 years ago, if you would have told me that uh, Tony Stark's death would mean more than Superman's death did in pop culture, I would have turned and looked at you and been like, who the fuck is Tony Stark? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, to answer uh, your question, Tom, honestly, I walked out of the theater watching this movie and on, I give it a, between a seven and eight out of 10. I didn't think it was a great movie, but I thought it was a fun movie. You know, it's like one of those movies that you watch and you enjoy. It had a lot. Of, there wasn't really a lot of things bad about it, but there wasn't a lot of things great about it. It was just it was an above average film. I didn't love the movie, but I love some of the choices. I think uh, Django Fett did a fantastic job in this movie. I can't think of his name. Tamaro. It's a very long, complicated Pol Polynesian name, and I don't know how to say it. <laughs> 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 Begins with a T. But I thought Nicole D Kidman did a great job. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think the special effects on de-aging Willem Dafoe was bad either. And uh, the underwater scenes, I mean, they can, they seem kind of, especially when they're like, the hair is floating, it's obvious CG. In my opinion, I think it fits with the feel of the movie. It's yeah. a movie that doesn't try to take itself too seriously. It Th knows that's... what it is, and it plays to that key. Yeah, I really, I like that too. I like how the movie does, the movie, it's the first DCEU movie that's not afraid to admit it's based on a comic book or not ashamed to admit it's based on a comic book, whereas it felt like um, Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, a Suicide Squad, like they were all ashamed to admit that they've been based on comics. Like DC is almost like ashamed to admit that. 
Ooh, you know Superman's a comic, right? No, dark, angsty. Yeah, yeah, but this movie's not. This movie and Wonder Woman were just not afraid to admit that they're based on comics. So you know, honestly, I think that goes back to uh, like you said earlier, lack of boardroom involvement. Because, like I said, the Batman v Superman feels like it was a design by committee. Like, the name itself, just you break it down, Batman v Superman. Up until that movie came out, Batman was one of the highest grossing superheroes of all time. So they're like, Batman needs to be first in the title, and you've got to have the word justice in there, just so everybody knows Justice League is coming. It's like, anybody in their right mind would have thought, well, Superman needs a sequel first. And it's like, this one, they're like, guys, this ain't one of our big IP. It's Aquaman. I mean, come on. Do what you want. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Fast and the Furious Underwater. You don't have to <laughs> Fast and the Furious movie. I want it to be a Fast and the Furious movie underwater, guys. I'm not going to lie. That's to answer my own question. I want it to be a fun film made by people who were yep. having fun making it. And that's exactly what I think you're going to get. Like, don't expect an Oscar worthy uh, anything. But it's a fun ass movie that I've never not enjoyed. Never not enjoyed. There's there, there's your double negative there, English major. <laughs> I'll, I'll allow it this time just because we'll just, we're talking about Aquaman. We'll, we'll just say we're really happy that Tom edits these things. So, yeah, Tom, I know that in, in you're right in your opinion. You know, you, you didn't like Man of Steel. You hated Batman v Superman. I don't even think you've seen Suicide Squad, which is fine because it's not good either. Just no, I much. did. No, it's, it's not I good. did. I even saw the director's cut, and if that's what the director wanted, dear God, I don't want to see what they actually showed. Although it is kind of funny. Remember the joke we said – we used to say about Batman v Superman? Like, Remember when we were hoping that Batman v Superman would make Man of Steel better? Yeah, in and retrospect, it, it's like we think re- that it would make Man of Steel a better well, movie and fix all of its flaws. Yeah, well, the Suicide, the suicide Squad sequel actually makes Suicide Squad better <laughs> for the same tragic reason. <laughs> I mean, James Gunn's going to be doing the new Suicide Squad, so it can't be any worse. No, it could. He did. He did do Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Everybody liked that movie, but you. It was average. <laughs> it was a pretty average film with a great soundtrack. That's official for the internet. You all can argue about that stuff. I'm right. And what's funny it. is uh, I'm, I'm not even going to comment on that except <laughs> for that last comment and this one. But like you could tell Suicide Squad tried, tried so hard to be Guardians of the Galaxy. WB threw around their money. It's like, yeah, we're going to have Queen. We're going to have this song and this song. We're going to have all the big hits. You could tell that we're going to have a better soundtrack. And somehow it didn't. <laughs> all right. So uh, do we want to get this movie started or did you have another question there, Thompson? No, that was it. You guys answered it and then some. So, Nigel, you got any your... closing comments? I don't. Um, I I think I'm gonna wait to do any more comparisons from this film to the DCEU for my final thoughts. So sounds like a plan. All right. Well, All right. I guess we'll uh, get this started. Tom, cue the music, please. Unless Dan, you, you want t- to say that. <laughs> yeah, N- N- Nigel. Yeah, you get to say yeah, the line Dan. now. Ooh, Nigel, I get to say the line. You get to say the line. Tom, music cue. Oh, damn it! I got it wrong. You <laughs> fucked it up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Repeat <laughs> after me. Tom. Tom. Cue the music. Music cue. Tom. Do it. That works. Just do it. Close (laughs) enough. Let's go with that. Tom, cue the music. Welcome back to another splashing episode of The Fire Pit. I am your interspersal host, editor, and lighthouse keeper, Tom. Just park your boat anywhere on the rocks. It'll be fine. This is part two of our sink or swim summer tour. Our vacation to the destination that is Jaws. And apologies if I sound a bit off today. I'm recovering from a bit of the old seasick. It's less COVID-19, more White Castle number six. So no worries about me on this end. And also no new news or ads for this week's episode. But if you have any thoughts, comments, recommendations, ads you would like to pay for, or what have you, you can always email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. 
uh, just put in the subject line what you have in mind or what you need to get off your mind, uh, whether you have suggestions or root recommendations or what have you. And we'll be sure to give them the same consideration we give all of our regular mail, where we give it a read and forget all about responding, just like classic mail. Again, that email is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. And for past and future episodes, you can find us on firepit.podbean.com, great hosting site, home for such podcasts as Critical Role and a lot of other good ones, and us in particular as well. You can also find us on Spotify and iTunes now by searching for the keyword Fire Pit. Feel free to circulate the links, let the fire pit spread, grow, whatever fire pits do. But that's enough for me. Time to paddle back to the rest of the group. Thanks for listening, and as always, good luck. Da 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 Water underwater man underwater underwater Lens flare Water Underwater man. <laughs> he swims in the ocean and doesn't wear a shirt. He is <laughs> the uh, water man. Oh, shoot. I think my pizza's here. Stand by, guys. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Do we want to have our final thoughts? Thompson, I think uh, since you got the king, you get to go first. Okay, where to start? <clears throat> uh, it sucked. <laughs> I'm just going to come out and say this. I'm, I'm glad I did not see this for full price in a the theater. I would have been pissed off. Now, don't get me wrong. This was, um, this was a perfectly serviceable laundry folding film. The film you have in the background, while you're doing anything else and watch it, you look up, oh, this is a cool scene, and then you go back to doing whatever you were doing. Dishes, folding laundry, homework, it's fine. I honestly found us talking through the majority of the dialogue about the film, so it's already better than Pathfinder, so good on you. But I didn't miss anything of the plot or character development while we were talking as opposed to Life Aquatic where if you look down for a second you missed something kind of crucial this one uh, some of the th notes I wrote down we talked about this and we all agreed on it when we noticed it. The goddamn zooming close-ups on every moment that was supposed to be serious. Am I right that it was one of the most distracting things in the film? And that's Especially a during that scene, yes. It's like it, every angle. Zoom. Zoom. Yeah, I kind of want to go back and watch the movie again just to point, see those scenes again for myself because once Tom pointed it out, I couldn't unsee it. And they kept resetting back to the same point. So it's not like they continuously zoomed and then went to the next. It was like a similar point and they zoomed. No, it's like it was point A, then they zoomed to point B. Next person, point A, point B. Third person, point A, point B. They never really went any closer than that. So I right. get, I don't know. It's it was distracting. The plot was. Did it feel like to any of you guys that it was maybe three seasons of a TV show that they stitched together into a movie? No, I just thought it was a very basic paint by number superhero movie plot. It very much was, but I understand where you're coming from because it's like you had three main sections, like acts, so to speak, like on mm -hmm. land, in Atlantis. The, the journey at the end uh, basically ended up the desert, Sicily, the trench, mm -hmm. and then the final battle. So I could see what you're 
which are good. Okay, I see that point now. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't jarring. I mean, we've we've watched films that took place in a tighter time frame that had far more jarring cuts than this film did. So I guess progression wise, there was an A point, a B point, a C point, yeah. a D point. I wouldn't call some of the choices they made subversions. And we discussed this while we were watching it. I kept pointing out moments that were supposed to happen. The standard, like, okay, this is a scene where Aquaman's dad dies and he didn't. And I don't think that's a subversion. I think that it was just someone was painting by the numbers, like, how about we just don't kill the dad in this scene? And we don't kill the mom in this scene. Let's it's, just not do that. I think it falls into one of those things where it's just like modern, you know, I blame Game of Thrones for this, that it's just like, let's just kill people off to kill people off. We don't care what it's going to do to the plot. Mm. But it's like, we've become accustomed to that, to the point where it's, we are expecting people to die off now just for shock value. But this movie didn't do it because it's like, it wasn't mm -hmm. critical to the plot. Well, Aquaman didn't have any personal stakes in this. Manta Ray had personal stakes because we had the obligatory villain's dad needs to die. So he has a personal reason to go after Aquaman. But aside from that, barely, Aquaman... I really don't like that entire scene when he like the sea judge him or whatever. I just always felt like that was very out of character for Aquaman. No, you're, you're not wrong. <sighs> it just was not a good film, guys. Also, uh, it... I think... I think it would have played. It would have been better if the callback, because when when he overpowers Ocean Master at the end of the movie, and he's got the killing blow set up, and Ocean Master tells him to finish it, he says, "Mercy is not our way." That scene would have meant more if Aquaman had saved uh, Black Manta's dad earlier in the movie. Yeah, or, I agree. Sure. Instead, sure. instead he yeah. said, "Yeah." Instead, he says, "You kill innocent people, and yet you ask the sea for mercy." Yeah, yeah, and you know, I didn't even catch the hypocrisy in that until you just pointed out. Yeah, well, he goes through some character development that also lightens his mood, so to speak. So he does show mercy at the end. It just Plus, I he think just got his mom back. Yeah, I think it would have been a little more powerful if it, earlier in the film he would have. Maybe you could still have Black Manta's father die in that scene, just like maybe Aquaman tries to save him, but he still dies, and then then he can still or blame Aquaman for his death. Split the time frame up, have him send his son away first, saying he's going to die, and then have Aquaman come save him or try to save him, but then like the thing explodes and he tries to take Aquaman with him. So his son leaves thinking Aquaman killed him, but then Aquaman actually tried to save him at the end, but then the d dad tried to blow him up. I guess that moment was to sh supposed, you guys pointed out, it's supposed to show character growth on Aquaman's part, but it didn't, he didn't earn it. He didn't earn to get to that point. It's just he changed the chains because he got a trident. That's really it. He didn't see someone close to him die out of revenge, and he saw, oh, revenge killing or anger killing is a bad thing. I shouldn't do it anymore. They, he just decided not to at that moment. It, there was no emotional growth for the guy. He was kind of pulled into this whole situation. It's like, we've got to do this to stop this guy from causing war. He wasn't an active protagonist in this. Mara kind of like, you got to keep doing this. Like, okay. And then he did. And some people would call that a weakness. A weak character, some would call it. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm indifferent towards that, but it didn't make as compelling. I wasn't as emotionally invested in the character or what he was doing. Right. So for me, that was my... Those are some of my major takeaways. I don't want to hog all of it because I'm sure I'm curious to find out what you guys thought of it. Also, Amber Heard and um, Will, uh, yeah, Jason Momoa's chemistry was just it was. I'm sure they they were professional enough to make it work, but I love that the whole final kiss scene was just a forehead kiss and that was all they could manage and that says everything right there dan you go ahead okay um i'm not going to be as harsh on it as tom um i think that this is definitely compared to other dc movies it's fine it's not great it's a good pb and j sandwich it's not a steak dinner 
it's serviceable. If if I was to grade this in comparison to other, like to, I know the DC fanboys don't want you doing it. Like, hey, don't compare them to Marvel because they're not the same kind of movies. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, you're gonna get they're compared. Too. They're yeah. superhero movies. Come on. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get not compared. get that, that comparison. You're at Iron Man 2 levels now. You're Thor 2, okay? You're a serviceable movie, but you're not there yet. You still have yet to come up with a Captain America Winter Soldier. Uh, Wonder Woman is probably their Iron Man 1, which, good film, not great, but a good movie that you could probably, like... Let's make this the jump off point. But you haven't made a Captain America Winter Soldier yet. You haven't made a movie that makes it transcend from being just a superhero film to a good movie. I'm not saying I'm, I need I need it to be that. I didn't need Aquaman to be more than it was. I'm just saying that but this movie was fine. It's fine. That's, that's all I can really say about it. It's fine. I enjoyed it. It entertained me. But it's not filling. I don't know. It's, it's like Tom says. I, it's a movie I definitely would throw on if I'm folding laundry or if I need something to run in the background. Or if um, I'm babysitting kids and they want to watch it and I'll sit and watch with them and I'll be okay with it. But to me, it's not its not like some other superhero films and like where I seek them out. And I'm like, oh, I really want to watch that movie today. And I cue it up and I watch it. Nice. Reginald. Well, um, I like this movie. Um, mm-hmm. But again, I think a 7 out of 10 is a very accurate rating for it. I, I, honestly, I love that analogy where you're like, I don't actively seek it out. I remember I got Disney Plus and I was like, I want to watch a movie. So I threw on the the first Avenger, you know, Captain America, the first one. Yeah. And I meant to watch that as background music, but I ended up being drawn into it and I watched it. Then I ended up watching Winter Soldier, Civil War. It's like I always go on these random Marvel tangents where it's like I'll pick a character and I'll watch all the movies that they were in. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just gone through and I'd been just kind of half-assing watching through the DCEU. Yeah. But it's like none of them really capture me the way Marvel does and – Again, comparing it to the MCU, it's really hard not to when they tried to have their own the MCU versus the DCEU. I don't get that. <laughs> but uh, they're obviously trying to be that, and I think that they cannot pull that off. This movie is good in terms of it's a popcorn flick that if you can take your brain out, if you invest too heavily in the plot, you're going to be disappointed. The special effects, as we pointed out several times tonight, are lacking... Yeah, inconsistent. There you go. Thank you. They're lacking in certain parts, but they're really well literally seconds later. Yeah. Like they farmed it out or something like that. Like the B team and uh, then the main team. Yeah, the first confrontation with Orn in the throne room where Aquaman's in chains and all that. I'm sorry, that CG in that scene looks like shit. Most of it looks like a PlayStation 1 or or even an early PlayStation 2 cutscene. The armor looks so fake. It's... It, t- it took me out of the story. It made me very aware at that point I'm watching a film. And I'm, you and then know. And not 30 seconds later, we're in the ring of fire scene and everything looks fantastic. Yeah, it's it was jarring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the movie is very much, <laughs> I beg your pardon for this pun, but it's like being on the high seas. You got its ups and its downs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good analogy. And it fits the theme. We're on our way to Jaws. So I'm saying I, I do like the movie, though. It's fun. Like, I watch Pacific Rim because I want to watch a movie about giant robots fighting giant monsters. If I want to watch this movie, I want to watch just a brain-dead superhero action movie. I pointed out that one thing I do like about Aquaman is that he's relatable. You know, he doesn't memorize stuff. But it's like that's unnecessary character development done for humor in the movie. You know, it, it makes him relatable, and I get what they're going for in that scene. But at the same time, it follows that level of inconsistency in the film. So at least one consistent thing in this film is its inconsistency. That's been almost my view on every single DCEU film. I can see the good movie trying to get out, and yet you're still missing the mark. I don't know what you can do to get over the hump, but you're you're still there. You're 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 not Marvel yet. You're you're not. It's a shame. I don't think they it ever be. will be. I don't know if they ever can be. You're right. I don't know if they ever will I, be. I don't think they should try to be. It's that one kid in school that tries so hard to be the cool kid and just hurts to watch. I remember talking to my nephews. It's like, who's your favorite superhero? Expecting them to say Batman or Superman or something like that. And they're like, oh, probably Iron Man or Captain America. And I'm like, are you serious? I was like incredulous. They, you think Iron Man's better than Superman? And then I got to thinking about it. They were like 10 uh, when Iron Man came out. So when they were getting into superheroes, that was what they were introduced to. They got Iron Man. They got Captain America. That's what they grew up with. And I was just thinking, it's like, shit, the last good DC thing to come out was probably uh, 
Justice League, and that got canceled in 2004. Uh, that's really depressing to think about. Also kind of interesting to think, because like, you ask them the question, like, what's, who's your favorite DC movie hero? A lot of people are probably going to say Aquaman now, <laughs> which we never would have expected. Black Panther and Aquaman made more money than a Batman and Superman movie. The two highest grossing DC movies are Wonder Woman and Aquaman. We live in strange times yeah, indeed. This is a very strange timeline. I would almost go to say the darkest, just given 2020. I want to say it's the darkest timeline. Yeah. It's a weird one. <laughs> say it as it is. But no, I mean, seriously, DC or it just or it irritates me that DC is so far behind. They owned the 90s. Also, unlike Marvel, who in the 90s were so broke, they had to farm out their characters to other movie studios, which is why Marvel Studios just now finally got the rights back to X-Men and Fantastic Four and all that. It's because they, they farmed buy Fox. out. <laughs> yeah, they had to buy Fox to get them back. But that's why Spider-Man technically owned by Sony Pictures. That's why like a lot of their other characters were farmed out to other studios. It's because they were so broke. That's what they did. That's never happened with DC. They were bought out by Warner Brothers uh, in the early 90s, late 80s. And Warner Brothers has owned every single DC character since. So they should have been able to do this first. You were just saying, Josh, you made a good point about how kids these days, their favorite superheroes are Captain America and Iron Man and Thor. And you're like, because they've been growing up with those movies in the medium. Yet, let's call a spade a spade. There hasn't been a good Superman movie since Superman 2. At least not a yeah. universally loved Superman movie since but Superman. But then again, why was Batman so popular? Was Batman popular because of the 89 and 90 Batman movies? Or was Pop. he popular because of the Batman animated series? Both. I would say both. The 1989 Batman movie, that led to the animated series because that movie made so much money. And that's yeah. probably why Batman is their most bankable superhero. Mm -hmm. And the one that makes still makes the most money. The one that still gets a movie greenlit all the time. Because he is still immensely popular. And, and, and I'll be honest, most of the time, like, I see kids at Halloween, if they do dress up as a DC hero, it's nine out of ten times it's Batman. Sometimes it's Superman. Sometimes you see a girl dressed up like Wonder Woman or something. But for the most part, it's Batman. Though, again, how many more of you are going to see uh, Aquaman? Probably I haven't seen an Aquaman, Aquaman yet. Yeah. But... yeah, me either. Well, jeans and a you know shirtless with a trident, boom, you're Aquaman. <laughs> Although I will admit, I will admit, one of the more interesting things is one of my uh, friends up in my reserve job, his son... And I got to give his son credit for this. A year or two ago, he went as Steve Trevor for Halloween. Oh. Yeah. He, he loved the character Steve Trevor in Wonder Woman, and that's who he wanted to go as for Halloween. And I thought, you showed me the picture. He's like, who, who, who's he dressed up as? It's from a superhero movie, and I'm sitting here looking at it like, I have no idea. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's Steve Trevor from the Wonder Woman movie, Chris Pine's character. And I'm like, no shit. <laughs> but I will say this positives about Aquaman is I can definitely tell that the studio isn't so much ruling by committee on these movies. And maybe that's because Aquaman, unlike Batman and Superman, is not their flagship character. So they maybe were a little more hands off. But I don't give a fuck what you do with it. It's Aquaman. I mean, come on, like this movie will ever make yeah. a billion dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, I, I have and I, I kind of like that they kind of sort of got away from the Zack Snyder influence. Like this movie did not feel like a Zack Snyder film. Sure. Um, I don't really mind Zack Snyder maybe being, I guess, a guiding force. He doesn't have any real creative say, but he keeps them pointed in a direction. And if not Snyder, someone with a vision for what the end goal is and philosophy of this DC movie verse is supposed to look. Because we saw what happened with the new Star Wars trilogy when they just said, well, we'll just see what happens. You yeah. can have the next story. And no one's communicating. No one has an idea what the target is going to be. And it's just a mess. Yeah, Just having someone that keeps them in that box and in their lane just as an example the suicide squad like um guardians of the galaxy let's make that film and this this joker film let's make it a super serious 1980s film one is way better than the other but none of them fit in the same box no none all. of them are in the same universe it's like they got an academy award winning suicide squad <laughs> next to an academy award winning joker but neither of them are in the exact same movie mm. or universe, you know? 
No, they're not. Yeah. But Aquaman like... definitely fits in whatever universe this was supposed to be. Yeah. Well, if you watch, I don't, I know you haven't seen it yet, Tom, but if you've seen Justice League, this movie did feel like it belongs in the same universe. But I'm just, I'm going to say the film might have sucked, but I'm glad I watched it with you guys in this and we had some fun doing it. Okay, but let me ask you this though, Tom. You, I know that both movies suck. But did you enjoy watching this more than you enjoyed watching – or, well, we didn't enjoy watching. Did you enjoy watching this more than Pathfinder? Oh, yes. I actually paid attention to this film. <laughs> okay. That's all I wanted to know because, like, yeah, Pathfinder was truly terrible. Was, Pathfinder was. was a test whether we really wanted to do this or not. <laughs> The fact we made it past that uh, gigantic hurdle mm -hmm. speaks volumes of our willingness to do this podcast. I know what true pain feels like, for I have watched Pathfinder. Yeah, it was, as you would say, a Pathfinder. <sighs> and much like Josh's joke right there, we're going to be going into some dead calm. Just no one... Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. I got it would have been better if you guys would have just groaned like at the uh, during the intro. We probably would have. We're terrible. We're not inconsistent at all. We're a lot like the DCEU. Thank you. <laughs> We're almost there. We just keep missing the mark. We need a Kevin Feige to direct us. Yeah, we do. That's we need, not going to happen. Need, we need Stop some comparing us to the MCU. We're different, Tom. Yeah. And we're not those other fire pit podcasts out there. <laughs> Unlike those other fire pit podcasts, we speak with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> we have British names. <laughs> Ten points for the Robin Hood men in tights uh, reference. Uh, I think that's a great note to go out on. Yeah. So who so, wants yeah. to who wants to run us down? Nigel, you, you start talking so you get it. Okay, fine. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, we are calming things down a little bit next week, uh, almost to a dead calm, if you would. That's uh, even worse than mine. Yeah, no, we'll be taking uh, uh, we'll... <laughs> next week we next well, and following the theme with Jaws. Next week, the three of us, all three of us together, sail into uncharted waters because we have no idea what we're getting into. We are watching a movie that neither of us have seen. In fact, we're watching a movie that all three of us hadn't even heard of until we started doing lists to see how we could get to Jaws. So uh, we're That's gonna be scary watching because last time we did this was Pathfinder. Yes, the last time we all walked into a movie blind was Pathfinder, and um, it says <laughs> I IMDb lists Deadcom under the horror and thriller genre. And I will say that Pathfinder was definitely a horror. Um, it was a horror to watch, not a horror film movie. So, yes, but we'll be watching 1989's Dead Calm next week. So please join us. Um, like I said, we have no idea what we're getting into with that film, but it seems interesting. And it's got a really high rating, so maybe it'll be good. I'm honestly expecting something to akin of double jeopardy in terms of what to expect. Like, not plot for point, you know, but just... It was trending on Netflix, so my wife watched it, and I was kind of forced to watch it too. But I don't hate that movie, so that's kind of what I'm expecting. Something right. on that level. And I am going in with no expectations whatsoever, and I'm looking forward to those being met. Excellent. Uh, shout out to Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting tonight's movie watching. Without those, we wouldn't have been able to watch them all together and at the same time and be able to discuss and chat and make this podcast. Special shout out to friend of the podcast, Peggy. Greatly appreciate her and all the bots that have been listening. You can find us at firepit.podbean.com. Uh, Podbean, great hosting site, uh, home to many a good podcast and they let us do our thing too, so kudos to them. You can also email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com if you haven't caught the many, many times I say it during the interspersal segments. You can also download us on Spotify and iTunes. Yes. Yeah, just search for Fire Pit on iTunes because for some reason, if you search the Fire Pit, we don't show up. But if you search Fire Pit, we're like third on the list. We come out after another podcast that isn't called Fire Pit. Don't ask me why. But we're there. The search engine is weird like that. It's but strange. It is. But stranger things have happened, and we may be going into Stranger with our next film, Dead Calm. But until then, this has been The Fire Pit. I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. And this has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Thank you for listening. Yes, and have a good luck out there.
and have a good luck out there. Yes. <laughs> That's, have have well, the good flowed luck. Flowed nicely. Flowed nicely. Hey, yes. Professional. That's what we are here. All right. Well, don't go shit on your bed and uh, have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't they just move to Montana? That would solve all of their problems. Go to Ohio, where there <laughs> is no ocean. Could be one of those things that the lighthouse has been in their family for generations. Yeah, when aliens from the ocean come shooting laser beams at me and my family, I say, hey, I got a cousin in Cincinnati. We'll shack up with them for a while. I'll work at a UPS. So I'm going to go be a dishwasher at Applebee's. I'm going to change my name to Jose Pacalalas. <laughs> yeah, sublet the goddamn lighthouse. <laughs> I'm just saying, when your problem can be solved by moving to Ohio, you really don't have that much of a problem. <laughs>